On today's episode, we look at the camouflage strategies of common shore crabs. I take a look at the AGM for the Cornwall Butterfly Conservation Group. And we'll be bringing you the secret world of fox cubs as they begin to emerge from underground. We're not going to stand on ceremony. We're going to launch you straight into the world of Cornish wildlife on our very first episode of Nature, Nature Watch. I'm Ethan. And I'm Pete. We are here on a beautiful sunny afternoon in the jungle shed on the Penryn campus. This place is ideal for promoting conservation, it's rich in biodiversity and is all about organic living. As Liz has said, this place is fantastic for growing produce for students, but it's also a fantastic habitat for wildlife. We've got a variety of wildflowers around here, attracting a myriad of insects and butterflies in at day and night. And beneath our feet, hundreds of small mammals team about out of sight, mice, voles, shrews, Badgers and foxes patrol through from the woods down at the bottom of campus and we even get hedgehogs down there. And not only that, there's a huge diversity of bird species around here from all the common songbirds to the firecrest that we saw over there the other day, sparrowhawks flying through and buzzards hovering above. So I had the amazing opportunity of meeting with researcher Jenny Easley, interestingly, about the camouflage in the common shore crab. Take a look. I am at Gilly Beach, a jewel in the crown of the Falmouth coast. Not for the long sandy beaches, not for the beautiful views, but for the amazing rock pools. I'm meeting Jenny, a master's student at the University of Exeter's Cornwall campus, who is researching camouflage in shore crabs as part of the sensory ecology team. She has kindly agreed to show me how to find them. seawater um, split into lots of different sections and each background has a different colour and all we do is pop the crab on and we just leave it um, and we leave them to see how their colours change and what we're doing now is swapping them over so we leave a white crab on a white background for a month or so um, and then we switch it back to a black one um, and then we're just looking at the moment to see how they can, how well and how quickly they can possibly adjust back. Um, but also, kind of most importantly, um, our PhD student, um, Sarah Minot, is looking at how this relates to climate change. So each of these tanks, we've actually got a, a different temperature. So we can see how changes in temperature in the sea due to climate change may affect their ability to become um, or stay camouflaged. So it tells us a lot about evolution of camouflage, it tells us a lot about the ecosystem that they live in um, and it's really interesting stuff. How amazing is that? That was really really cool, yeah, that's fantastic absolutely. stuff. 
And the most fascinating thing about it all is that it can take a minimum of two hours. Mm. So these guys will be out researching and they'll have them in white buckets. And if they were to leave it for longer than two hours, these crabs would be noticeably whiter, mm. In like, their pigments would be whiter and their general, I mean, they'd be harder to see, mm. which is the ultimate point. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, so people imagine this kind of camouflage biology to be sort of reserved to the chameleons and the you know, leaf-tailed geckos are far away, but you know, to have something like this right on our doorsteps that no one else is really aware of right now, that's absolutely fascinating stuff. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. and, it, and it's the sort of thing where you can link the predators and prey across any species. It'd be interesting to see whether you do see it in other crabs or, like you said, in, in geckos and other species. Mm. Well, yeah, sounds really cool. Yeah, yeah cool. fantastic. Cool. Well, recently I paid a visit to Churro to see the AGM for the Cornwall Butterfly Conservation Group. So we're here today at St. Elm Community Centre, where we're attending the AGM for the Cornwall Butterfly Conservation Group. The Cornish Butterfly Conservation AGM was hosted in Truro in late March. The team and I were greeted by homemade pasties, interesting people and a whole host of fascinating tales. And we'll be talking to Paul Waring, a freelance biologist and moth enthusiast. Do you know, it started for me when I was less than three years old and I was already finding caterpillars. Mm -hmm and I was interested in them just because they moved on their own accord. It's like having a dinky toy that did its own, its own mm. stuff. And then, of course, I realized that a caterpillar changes through a chrysalis or a pupa into a moth, and I wanted to find out what the moth was. You can argue the case that moths are important to human beings because they pollinate mm. a lot of our crops, and without them, somebody would have to go around with a little brush, and that clearly isn't going to happen. Um, so there's that. And there's lots of other arguments that you can say, well, you know, humans need moths. But moths don't need humans. Yeah. Really, they don't. I mean, they were here for millions of years beforehand. My career as, if you like, Paul Waring, the moth conservationist, yeah. <laughs> has, in some cases, been to save species from the brink of extinction in the, the British Isles. And the Barbary carpet moth that you mentioned is one example of that. We established a completely new population of the Barbary carpet in an area where it had never been recorded before. and We'd done lots of experiments to try and find it, and it definitely wasn't there. We introduced caterpillars and we formed a colony which is thriving and has multiplied such that it is now as strong as the largest of the remaining wild colonies in this country. You can't get better than that. No, you can't, can you? I'm actually positive about the future because each one of us with things like the internet and so on has much more power to influence large numbers of people. We have technologies which mean that whatever we do we can do it more efficiently than ever before so we can record moths in larger numbers and survey them and pull in more people than ever before. You know wildlife can earn its keep, wildlife is a value, a value and it's not just in monetary terms and more and more people are realising that as every day, minute, generation go by. And, and that message is being spread more effectively now than ever before. Yeah. And we can all play our part. And the one thing that I took away from that day is actually that the public don't necessarily perceive butterflies as a group of organisms who actually necessarily need conservation. When actually, it's people like Paul Waring who are really saving that species and keeping them going. Yeah. Well, there's so many different factors that are affecting butterfly and moth populations when you look at it. I mean, you know, you've got climate change pushing some species not ranges north while others are coming in from the continent. But then, you know, the change in farming practices, you know, there's still so many neonicotinoids and uh, um, pollutants out there. Um, and the fact that butterflies are a quite a specialist species. Uh, you'll get very common ones like red admirals and peacocks. And that's because, like, stinging nettles, they're actually their food plant, they're everywhere. Whereas you look at something like the, uh, the uh, orange tip butterfly, which relies on cuckoo flower, uh, mm. or in the marsh fritillaries. And the tortoise shell, right? Small tortoise shells, yeah. yeah. Uh, but then small tortoise shells are an interesting one, because they actually do rely on the stinging nettles that, say, these common species, the red admirals, peacocks, rely on. But they underwent a massive decline, about 75% in the last 10 years. And no one's still quite sure exactly why. I mean, there's some evidence of maybe parasites, but it's just something under the nose, and quite terrifying that these very common childhood animals are disappearing under our noses. Mm. So it'd be fantastic to see the great work of Paul and, and to see actually how these changes, small changes, but gradual, mm. do have a positive effect on the bottom mm. butterfly, mm. you know, mm. butterfly numbers. Yeah. Fact for you, did you know butterfly wings are in fact transparent? I did not know that. I didn't know that. Did you know? No. no. Basically they're covered in scales which then reflect different types of light, hence yeah. different coloured butterflies. Learn something new every day. Every day. Well mm. there you go, we don't, we don't pass on the facts on Nature Watch. Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs>
Now we may be talking about declining species of the butterflies, but in terms of the foxes, this is an animal that definitely isn't having its blue Monday when it comes to its UK distribution. They're one of our, one of our most common carnivorous mammals, uh, and now is a perfect time to actually see the young coming up from above ground. Uh, one of our students, Oscar Furness, has had some great footage of fox cubs from his home in Bristol sent into Nature Watch, and we'll be reviewing that now. So as we can see here, they're still very young cubs. Maybe, you know, how would we say, about 11, 14 days yeah, old? Yeah, something like that. They're definitely under 14 days, because uh, as you see in a second, their eyes are still closed, their ears are still folded over, which means they're blind and deaf at the moment. So still very highly dependent on their mother. Fantastic footage, look at that. Mm. That's great stuff. So there's three, right? There's three of them. I mean, like, well, it's, it's difficult to tell this day, isn't it? But yeah. in, term, in terms yeah. of a litter, that's, that's quite yeah. average, if not anything, yeah. it, it's a few less than normal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, well we'll say when I was about 15, I used to go out and watch Fox Family about six cubs. You know, Absolutely. all that there with mum. Uh, every sort of sunny afternoon in June. You know, it's fantastic, fantastic. Way to spend my time. Look at them. Okay, and okay. here we see the, uh, the mother fox comes in and just there she is. Oh, like, fantastic. Just underneath the deck in there. Mm -hmm. And look at how aware she is. She's using all her senses, her hearing, her sight. She's very on point. Obviously, these are three cubs, so she has to look after them and, uh, and be fully aware mm. of any dangers. Mm. And being urban foxes, we imagine them being generally quite fearless. Um, but, you know, of course, like all animals, you've got to be wary. You know, even our urban uh, cities nowadays, foxes are facing a lot of unnecessary persecution. Mm. Uh, essentially, demonised for, you know, a lot of uh, scientifically unsound reasons. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Got reason to be cautious. Yeah. Actually, one interesting point to point out is that actually, uh, you know, she's obviously made her little dugout underneath a shed, which is actually a really common place for urban um, foxes to do it. In the rural areas, they would often do it within hedgerows or uh, under stick piles or anything like that. Mm. Oh, she just picked up a cub. What's she going to do with it? Where's she going? She's less, she can hear things, she can see things, she's mm. very, very aware. Mm. Extremely acute sense of smell as well. Oh, to have that sense of smell would be fantastic. Yeah. You don't even need your eyesight when you can just see the world in that way. Absolutely. Mm. And foxes can smell you from a quarter of a mile away, so living, like you said, in an urban area, basically a concrete jungle, she... Mm. Oh, look nope. at that, she's just taken yeah. away a cub. So I'm guessing this is due to relocating because she's been disturbed or she's found mm. a better den. It's quite common in foxes for them to relocate mm. their cubs mm. simply based on the fact that if they find somewhere better, why not, why not move mm. them? Mm. Well, it, is a, it is a lot of energy to do that, you have to bear in mind. And of course, an animal's not going to expend energy unnecessarily. Um, I'm thinking of an urban fox, which of course faces people pretty much every day. It's got to be a very uh, dramatic reason for it to sort of relocate its den. Mm. So generally den destruction, we would say, often links back to that unnecessary um, persecution that foxes have in our cities. Yeah, I was going to say, they must be a little bit more tolerant than the rural. Mm. Yeah, rural definitely. Family. Oh, yeah. We well, have to walk in London at the night time and the foxes will see you and just not, re not really yeah. move away. They sass yeah. you out, you know. So, you know, fox ecology isn't one straight thing. We've got to bear in mind of nature. It's not a case of one point to the other. It's very much a mass of, you know, wibbly wobbly ball of, you know, outcomes that we can't quite predict. You know, it's Spaghetti Junction. It's a bizarre love triangle of outcomes that as naturalists and scientists, we only do our best to understand. Once we find one answer, we then find more questions. But then that's probably the best thing about being an ecologist. It's going mm. round and round to discover new things about nature that we never could have realised before. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll keep in touch with Oscar and the Fox family to see their distribution and what they're up to. <laughs>